Okay, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the 13th Annual CSL Student Conference. We're excited to have you. Thank you guys for participating in our conference. Okay, before introducing Eric and getting on with the plenary talk, I want to just give a brief overview of the conference uh, as a preview for what we have planned. Uh, so tomorrow and Friday are the we have our technical sessions, which comprise the main portion of the conference. Uh, for these, we usually invite a speaker from outside. So actually two speakers, one student speaker and a professor or uh, a researcher in the industry. Uh, so the first session that we have will be uh, tomorrow morning. It's called Information Processing in Silicon. Uh, now, one thing I do want to note is we have the names of our invited speakers above. Uh, and then we have the UIUC speakers below, uh, not names, but please do not mistake that for uh, anonymity. I would like to point out that the CSL Student Conference, it is organized by CSL students and it is organized for CSL students. One of the main points of this conference, in addition to all the you know wonderful events that we have, the job fair, the poster session, uh, and the like, is we want to show off the wonderful research and the amazing collaborative community that we have in CSL and at the University of Illinois. So we're excited to have you guys participate in this experience and we hope that you value it and appreciate it as much as we do. Okay, so uh, the next session will be in the afternoon. It's Artificial Intelligence in Action. And then for Friday, we have Decision and Control in the morning and Machine Learning Theory in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, one comment about the Keynote speaker, unfortunately, Alan Tenenbaum was sick, so we'll be streaming his, his talk live here today. Okay, special events. Tomorrow we will have a panel discussion during lunch. Uh, this, the topic of the panel discussion will more or less be technology and health. Uh, the title of it is How Will Technology Reshape Our Democracy? And it isn't meant to be a political talk, it is supposed to be meta-political. What, you know, in what ways do we see problems arising in politics as a result of technology? It should be very exciting, um, and I hope that you can come for that. In the afternoon, on Thursday, we will have a poster session. Uh, uh, we have about 15 to 20 posters uh, of students from UIC and a few external as well. And then on Friday, during lunch, we will have a robotics demo. Now, one point to make, uh, one of our selling points with the, UIC, uh, the CSL Student Conference is that we have a lot of food. Uh, so, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there will be food uh, during the panel discussion hall, lunch from Papa Dell's, and then during the robotics demo as well. And then, of course, today after the plenary talk, we will have Black Dark, a local favorite. Uh, okay. And then, one more thing. So, today after Eric's talk, we do have dinner, and then after the dinner, we will have an informal after hours networking event in ECB 3002, which is where the job fair was. So I hope you can uh, join us for that. And with that, I will let Tori take over and uh, give our acknowledgments. Thank you, James. So we are very pleased to see everybody's excitement. And this would have, wouldn't have been a success without the contribution of a lot of people helping in the coordination and organization of this conference. Uh, so I would like to uh, give a big thanks to Norman, uh, the director of research in CSL, who put us in contact with Microsoft. Uh, and coordinated with how Microsoft coordination with uh, the CSL Student Conference. I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Clara Narstadt for her continued support for CSL Student Conference. And I would like to acknowledge all those on this poster, on this uh, slide. And a big, big, big thank you to our amazing staff in CSL. It is a student-run conference, but it wouldn't be as professional as it is without the help of our staff. I would like to thank our sponsors. Um, who have been making this conference bigger and bigger every year. Uh, mainly our gold sponsor, Microsoft, and as you can see, the silver sponsor, R&D, bronze sponsors. And, of course, uh, this has been a collective effort of everybody here on the committee who have been working very hard for a year now, uh, preparing for this conference, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the importance of their contribution. It's been a great, great uh, pleasure working with everybody of you. Uh, with that, um, I would like to introduce Eric Corbett. He is a technical fellow and director of Microsoft Research Labs. His contributions span theoretical and practical challenges with artificial intelligence. His efforts and collaborations include the fielding of learning and reasoning systems in transportation, 
healthcare, aerospace, e-commerce, online services, and operating systems. He has been elected fellow of the National Academy of Engineering, the Association of the Advancement of AI, AAA, the American Association of Advancement Science, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received the Figebaum Prize and the Alan Newell Award for Research Contributions in AI. He was inducted into the CHI Academy for Advances in Human-Computer Collaboration. He has served as the President of AAAI, Chair of AAAS, Section on Computing, and on Advisory Committees for the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board, DARPA, and the President's Council of Advisors and Science and Technology. So thank you, Eric, for coming. It's been a pleasure coming here on campus. And we would like to give you a small gift on behalf of the oh, audience. Thank you very much. Objects and the ImageNet 
challenge. One of them, uh, last year, we saw that people are seeing now better than humans, and the reason for that was uh, a system that are doing quite well in vision. And even in reading comprehension, I, I would say it's, I think comprehension is an overstatement, but in answering questions about Wikipedia content, just last month, Microsoft and Alibaba, of all entities, came through and said we're doing now better than human. Uh, or, 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 you know, we're, we're competing with human levels of, of, of reading comprehension when it comes to that definition of comprehension. And beyond these simple computation tasks, we have now pipelines. For example, a pipeline that we're now is now commonplace, but I mean, three years ago, I thought this was stellar and stunning and surprising that we could take images and automatically caption them. So here's one example of, um, in black here, the machine is saying, this is a man doing a trick on a skateboard, and here's the human. Uh, the, the Turker who came up with that caption, the skateboarder is in there, a little typo, the machine will do that, so we know it's a human being, <laughs> and, um, um, and so on. And of course, R&D, we now see more work in vision, this is from our, from the, 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 our China group, the recognizing activities of various kinds. You can imagine how you might press these kinds of advances into service. Now, with that said, uh, people are, so at Microsoft, one thing we did uh, was we very quickly, um, we had this dream about seven years ago I remember we just barely got our system working or six years ago in a, in a demonstration at China, a, a massive conference hall, and we just barely got speech-to-speech -speech translation working. And Rick Rashid, who was the former director of Microsoft, was sort of on stage, and he started talking. We had everybody on the edge of their seats, and, and nothing was happening. And we said, OK, well, we, it was just at the edge. And then it started working beautifully. I remember looking behind me, and a woman, uh, a Chinese graduate student, took her translator off, and she had tears in her eyes as she listened to to Rick Rashid in his own voice speaking in Mandarin. But now we have a Skype translator and other, other um, speech to speech solutions coming from competitors that really can translate across many languages, um, changing the world in some ways. Um, the idea of having uh, what are called cognitive services at Microsoft that are available that people can program to now, detecting emotion, for example. Um, and I say that we're trying to change the world by introducing actual useful <coughs> Uh, reminders and, and ways to support people and empower them in life without their ton of work. Here's uh, an application that I tell people came out of our team, and I, I won't, won't tell you who, who came up with the idea, but let me just say that I really need this really badly in life. And the idea is in email, um, and this is one of the, of all things I've, I've, I've worked in healthcare and traffic, this is one I use daily and that I really enjoy, and it helps me a lot. I make lots of promises to people in email all the time. Like, I'll get to that soon, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, uh, how about the PowerPoint slides by Friday? Or in this case, I, I told uh, Ashita Dasgupta, a grad student at Cornell, yeah, I'll try to dig up that dissertation and I'll refer to it your poster session. Uh, it's available online, right? And so the fact that um, I can actually now automatically get a reminder that tells me, you promised Ashita this. And I can actually go back and say, OK, I found it. Uh, makes me a better collaborator and a better team player, which I think is really fabulous. Um, we're also seeing uh, machine intelligence, typically machine learning, and you can couple it with decision making, transforming key sectors. Here's something we built about seven years ago, which reads the EHR, the electronic, electronic health record, at hospitals, and automatically the auto ML goes back a few months and builds a classifier that can actually predict how, whether or not a patient will bounce back to the hospital 30 days, 30 days after they were discharged, and puts the actual probability into uh, the chart that doctors can use to guide their treatment. And we talked about how to use that for those numbers, actually, in decision analysis uh, based on costs and benefits, you know, thresholds. And think about it, I mean, this, this basic loop that we played with in healthcare and, and pushed on is kind of a golden uh, pathway for many different sectors where we will go from sense data to predictive models that give us distributions over future outcomes, for example, and then that's where many people stop, but then the next stage here, you can read about how we do this work, is to go to a cost-benefit analysis. So a system is actually making cost-benefit recommendations as to what, given the false positives and true positives, the false negatives, how to really take action in the world. And it's not just about recommendations, it's about insight building. I always say it's like we want to help people do better, to augment human cognition. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes tonight when we dig in a little bit here. I have to say that um, one of the biggest payoffs, I think, for AI is going to be in the core sciences. I didn't want to leave this out, mention how exciting this is. 
Back in the, in the in early 2000s, Daphne Kohler's team showed how you can use probabilistic graphical models to go from the Morse code of gene expression data um, and automatically induce these separate modules and their interfaces, showing biologists that we can have new lenses on what was going on uh, to simplify the complexity of, of, of biochemistry uh, and genomics. And this, I think, was a stunning result. It came out of our Cambridge lab. Um, Sarah Jane Dunn led the work. Um, but the idea is, in looking at how stem cells um, during the embryogenesis get transformed and stabilized into end tissues. Uh, we all understand the signaling there. It's being very complicated. By using a theorem prover called Z3, which was designed for software verif verification. Some of you guys do software and know about Z3. So it's the fastest theorem prover in the world now uh, in many areas of theorem proving. But applied this to reasoning about for constraint-based analysis and found that all you needed was three inputs to, biology was using three inputs to lock cells into place. Skin cell, done. Brain cell, done, locked from stem cell. And the fact that it was a theorem prover that helped us cut the complexity there is stunning. This was an article in Science just a few years ago. So uh, last year, we decided to take one of our labs, the Redmond Lab, our largest lab. I call it the starship of the of the Microsoft Research Lab System. And we said, let's actually think in a different way about AI, given some of the challenges ahead. And we decided to take about 100 people, all doing AI in different areas. And go back to this picture. Here's like the dream sequence, back to our different areas of AI. We've hired talent across the board since 1991, but Microsoft Research uh, was almost built on a pillar of AI aspirations. That's what Bill Gates and Nathan Mirvold told me when I got there. We wanted to really go for it to build, to have systems that would one day reason and think and see and hear. So I computed a few years ago that about a quarter of all Microsoft research was doing one or more areas of AI. Um, so we hired across the board, and my, the, the kind of the, the reason, kind of the rationale in my mind for why I wanted to create a Microsoft research AI focused team is this. Could we crystallize, this is like dream sequence, could we bring these areas together and unify them around what I said, we would say are, are actually five aspirations you can read about online, but I'll, I'll talk about three aspirations today, the major aspirations of Microsoft Research AI. And the idea is to organize everything we do along the aspirations, including our investments and our hiring. So the first one is, is attain more general intelligence. The second is master human AI collaboration. And the third is pursue insights and possibilities with AI people in society. And um, this is the way we, we, we view the three pillars. I'll start a little bit to say a few comments about each of these, um, this broadly, before we, we dive into some other, other examples. So, when you think about it, the, the advances that we've seen, as great as they've been, and I think sometimes even having a great speech recognition system can be earth shattering, uh, that actually works. Um, we've been largely building. Um, very narrow ledges of intelligence. In some ways, I would refer to these as savants. I won't say idiot savants, the savants. <laughs> but they're, certainly, they're very narrow. And there's a question about how far have we come with, with, with really understanding what I would call the mysteries of human intellect. And people in AI know we barely scratch the surface. In fact, uh, most people in the field would say, when it comes to the mysteries of human intellect, like uh, learning in the wild in an unsupervised way, or uh, understanding in real time the details that you need to understand to do common sense reasoning. Common sense reasoning, even as uh, my, my colleague Hamlet Kuhn said the other on Sunday in a panel we were on in Austin, you know, the common sense of a house cat, as he put it in his French accent, uh, or the, um, this idea of, of doing many things generalizing tasks and doing many different things at once. We haven't made progress, I'd say, since the phrase artificial intelligence was first used. Yet we see in the tech press and the media, oh, we're getting closer. Uh, it's really it's the case that we're not, and we have to push hard on this to, to make progress. And so what are the ways we might go beyond the wedges of intelligence? Well, one might be one approach we talked about and we pushed on in our lab is maybe we should take multiple competencies, perception and language skills, 
and in dialogue and looking at people and understanding a physical space around a system, um, social, social common sense, and weave them together into a symphony of intelligence that had many competencies as coordinated in some way by some interesting, poorly understood to date, connective tissue, we we'll call it. And that's one approach. So that might be one of the quarterbacks back to the deep networks fabric and think deeply about some innovation of the fabric itself. And so the idea is to, is to push the group to think about principles of more general AI. So with the integrated AI, we have systems we've built uh, and we play with that involve, that actually lead to interesting problems of coordination among competencies. Um, uh, one of these, this is a called Directions Robot, that's on every floor of our building, it's been running for several years. I have a, an assistant by my door that's been running for using data sets that are collected uh, over 15 years by my comings and goings, and she helps, or he, depending on the day, we go back and forth on gender, uh, with scheduling, uh, and, uh, and, and lets me know who's been by and so on. Uh, again, it's, 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 it, it really, we build this not just for service, but to explore innovative, innovative AI. Another interesting challenge with more general AI is how do we learn from data sets? Now, the big wins by Silver et al. in, in, in um, DeepMind, uh, AlphaGo, and AlphaZero were the fact that you can actually, with games of perfect information, you can generate massive data sets by running them against each other and, and collecting data from trillions of runs. Because in you know, a game of perfect information, there's no uncertainty. You, just, you, keep on, you just generate data by playing oneself. How do we go to the real world and gather trillions of situations and generalize appropriately to build intelligences in the same way that might be more effective than the current systems we have in the real world? Well, one idea is to actually build realistic environments. So this project, Airston, which is on GitHub, you all could you know, pull it down and play with it, um, it was the idea of can we build a realistic environment that has sufficient physics, gravity, magnetic fields, breezes, for example, with their drone work or, or driving work, and then build very realistic sensors that of the kind that sit on our drones and cars now, and, and our AI systems, so that we see what they would see in the synthetic world, and then we can run these systems many times, and of course you can, you know, you can even have access uh, without hurting anybody, and, and collect lots of data. Um, so one idea is, um, that's exciting is if you can run realistic simulations, even if they weren't perfect, maybe they generalized well, the idea basically is to actually do machine learning in these worlds. So for example, to take uh, two cameras to learn a convolutional neural network from the data you're collecting with, with thousands of runs, to then see better from monocular vision, uh, and then you can do planning and uh, reinforcement learning in this world, and then take, take your system into the real world and have a separate research project on mapping from the, the intelligence you'd have in, in the simulated world to the realistic situation you care about. Um, this is a direction right now where we're, we're moving and we think that we really have to go to really think deeply about data in, in this world. One example is uh, reinforcement learning. These are systems that are supposed to supervise learning, learn uh, from, by doing with, with, with immediate signals uh, and long-term goals. And so we're actually showing here how a car just starting out with very little knowledge uh, in, in this air sim system is learning how to drive over time. Now you wouldn't want to do this in your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> with reinforcement learning going on the street with a sign up saying standby, we're doing an RL experiment. <laughs> now um, we showed how you can use the air sim system to train up a model, or train up a reinforcement learning approach that would do a task like follow these power lines in this Canadian terrain without touching them so you could observe them and do inspections on them. With many trials, we built a system that we're pretty confident can actually feel down in the open world and it would probably do a great job. <coughs> now we move on to, um, and this is all, of course, that will give you a flavor if you can tell it, a tiny taste of where you might go here, and I felt we were going on you know, today here as well, um, in the department and at CSL. The second pillar is mastery human AI collaboration. 
People often think, in, um, I've noticed in the AI, in the, in the core of computer science areas, that humans are like kind of like, oh, now we're getting into the soft world of UX. It's actually harder for a system, I think, to compute and infer what a human being wants than an X chess move. It's a very interesting and challenging technical space that mixes design, sociology, psychology with computer science. Um, now, in this space, there, been, there will be new engagement capabilities. There will be new kinds of structural models. This shows work from our Cambridge lab that we haven't fielded yet that's using uh, a mixture of descriptive and generative models. So these aren't videos. This is actually a model of someone's hand at a distance. Um, this is Jimmy Shotton's team. What's amazing is of how uh, the subtlety of gesture that can be picked up at a distance. Um, I used to say if you can get thumb and forefinger into any world, you can build civilizations there. And I think we'll see more of this kind of work in the future, just like people using their hands to communicate and subtle, and subtle gestures. But a really important direction in thinking about human AI collaboration are models of complementarity. How can machines machines of intellect, extend human cognition to do new things and empower us in new ways. And in my mind, for years now, I've had this model, or this, this is the way I think, um, of human cognition as a blob with the, our abilities on the y-axis, and then there are these interesting biases and blind spots and gaps that cognitive psychologists have studied intensively for over 125 years, literature on what, what is it about people when they can't see this kind of thing, or make this kind of judgment mistake, or they can't reason about this visualization problem, or can't do this kind of math problem, for example? Now, could we design computational solutions that not just give us a pen and paper, which is great to augment human intellect, but actually understand the terrain of our minds better? And by actually going back to the literature, and also doing new cognitive psychology studies. Now, our team over the last 15 years has done work in memory, attention, and judgment. These are three pillars of cog psych. So if the psychologists in the audience, you know that literature is supposed to be applied in human AI collaboration. Let's talk about just some basic ideas here. Complementarity. So um, two years ago, there was a chameleon grand challenge, of what it was called. The, the, the challenge was, can we, we, we're asking uh, a computing system to detect metastatic breast cancer in lymph node tissue, where, 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 where breast cancer can metastasize. And it turns out that the best, the winning, the winning system that did the best was not as good as the expert. You were superior with only 3.4% error. But with a relatively simple combination of the two systems running side by side, error was reduced by 85%. Relatively simple combination. It turns out that the machine and human beings have different patterns of, of, of false positive and, and false negative rates. And by overlaying them, you can get better, better accuracy. But you can do much better. And in, in a project uh, that A.J. Kumar and I did a few years ago with Server and Hacker, um, we thought about the idea of, can we actually um, use machine learning and inference to learn the detail of complementary, how to do the weave? This was a project around supporting Astronomers, there was a crowd crowd uh, sourcing system called Galaxy Zoo, where people would go, get online and get trained. Some of you know the system, and you train to tag galaxies of various kinds. It, well, it turned out that we have like you know, you know we had hundreds of thousands of boats of users, and we have a little bit of ground truth. Um, but we realized we can actually apply machine vision to these images, these, these galaxies and other heavenly bodies, to compute probability distributions over what was there. And we had humans that could vote as well. And the question was, when do we use people versus machines? And so we actually uh, um, learned a rich graphical model to, to actually predict at any moment, you have to stop now, what's the correct answer? And if you ask a human being of this one here, what would they say, given their history and background and their, and their experience and capabilities as registered in the system? And this model here is combining visual features of the machine learning algorithm seeing with features of the votes to date and the people's performance in the past. And it turns out when you do this, we found out we can get full accuracy with half the human effort. And 95% of the accuracy of the whole system for all the tags with a quarter of human effort, just by doing the right complementarity. This was just, a, just bodes well for the future of augmenting human intellect, we thought. Now, where's this going? 
Well, the third most common cause of death in the United States today is med avoidable medical error in hospitals. This is stunning to me. If you believe this paper is coming out, this is a British Medical Journal, a very nice study, I thought, that says, quietly, and not making any headlines, like, like, like shootings or, or a bomb in Grand Central Station, wherever it might be, that, that a quarter, more than a quarter of a million people are dying every year because of an avoidable error in hospitals. Um, and so, and that's, that's like just after cancer and heart disease. So if you believe this, you'd say, well, I wonder what, what's going wrong in the hospitals. Could we use AI systems to build safety nets of the form that people put under the bridge, under the Golden Gate Bridge when it was being built, just in case people tripped, the physician had an error. Here's an example of a system that's getting at this, done with my colleagues, Mosin Bayati and Mark Barberman, We took a large data set, 15 years of hospital data, this was a, a data set from the MedStar Hospital, it's the ninth largest um, hospital, urban hospital in the United States in Washington, D.C. Um, and we had all this data of people coming to the emergency room and then leaving, say, you know, say, you're discharged. Um, and then we actually did a filter. We said, let's find all the people who were like discharged, okay, from the emergency room in the hospital. And then within 48 hours came back to the hospital and were admitted to the hospital as an inpatient with a serious problem for which the primary diagnosis when they came back was nowhere on the chart when they left. We call that a medical surprise. A surprise, a, a, something that would surprise an expert physician. Because hiding in the cognitive, in those gaps, in the, in the shadows of, of the mind, we say, can we build a system that at discharge time, with lots of surprises in it, there based on evidence, lots of observations, I would say, hey, before you say goodbye to this patient, let me tell you something that might surprise you about this patient. Now, if you told the doctor, you're not trying to replace the doctor, kind of figure out what's going to surprise the doctor based on 15 years of history, that might be more believable. Go, well, I'll, I'll, what, what do you have to tell me? You know, what might surprise me? Let me hear. Um, here's another example that's happening today. Uh, in the, in the, uh, actually, I'm working with Day Lee, a student at University of Washington. He's going to do his defense in just uh, two months, we just got his dates up. Um, and this is a problem called, another area of death in hospitals called failure to rescue. It's a phrase now used, which means death after a treatable complication. <coughs> so an organ failure shows up, and no one, no one misses it, and then there's a cascade of failures to death. Wow, I wish we could have caught that, that, that situation and not failed to rescue that patient. So with a large data set called MIMIC, 22,000 patients or so, we're trying to predict by looking at what goes on in the chart, when, a day, hours before or a day before, the probability that a life-saving intervention will be needed by this patient. An acute heart failure or for the life-saving intervention based on evidence. And to me, this is another great area that we're looking at, we're pushing hard on that. Now, another really interesting aspect of, I mentioned, I mentioned um, complementarity. Another pillar of human ad collaboration is coordination of initiatives. So here's our human cognition and machine intelligence. And it's the idea of, of a design for a mix of initiatives. If one think about the volley of contributions, when should the machine come forward and assist? Is there a back and forth? I'll give you an example from surgery. I'm, I, I sit on the advisory board of Johns Hopkins, and I'm very impressed by this work. I have to sell my advice. Um, but this is work by Greg Hager, a close colleague of mine for many, many years. Um, and what you see here is work by Carol Wiley, when she was a master's student. Um, uh, the idea was, can we look at through the intuitive surgical system, and can we look and try to recognize the semantics of surgery? Can we recognize with an HMM model, for those of you who are probabilists, um, when someone's reaching, positioning, inserting, a left transfer, a dropping, a loosening, recognize that state. And if you can recognize that state, you can imagine then starting to think about how can I have an automated surgeon work hand in hand with a human surgeon? What you see here is the machine is pulling a stitch. This is the first piece of the wee early days of this. Here's the human, manual mode, taking, a, taking back the suture needle, and he's choosing where to put that stitch. This is not real tissue, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking about this, I can still. 
exciting things to cook with like that. <laughs> um, and then back to automated here. So you see this uh, mach robot and machine working together, but this might, think of where this might go someday, and it's going to get, get going to into a smoother collaboration. Now, at, uh, at Microsoft, uh, we have lots of work going on in human human collaboration, human machine collaboration, this idea of multi-party coordination where a machine works with several people. I'm going to show you uh, a little bit about the, the assistant on my door here right now. So, um, in communication, there's often uh, quite a bit of uncertainty. Who, who's speaking? Can I see the person well? Uh, what's being said? Do I understand the answer? And behind the scenes of our assistant, there's many levels of uncertainty. These include, is it my turn? Agency, do I go? What I just heard? Um, do I, did I understand what was just said? Can I see who's here? Do I know the answer to a question? And we used to look at, at these levels as something we call like these little entity models, like how uncertain at any point in time the system is at these different levels of, of, the, of, a, di of a successful dialogue. And we worked with uh, Tomislav uh, Pejas, who was a student visiting us as an intern from Wisconsin, to basically say, how can I convert this to better coordinated signals between a machine and a human? And I'll show you how that looks right now in this test sequence here by my door. We have a little audio ring up here. Watch the facial expressions all be controlled programmatically by the entropy models by the, at a certain degree. Hi there. Are you here looking for that? Yes. Are you here for the two o'clock meeting with that? Sorry, did you say you were here for the two o'clock meeting with that? Yes. It is one of you, John. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I can't tell who is speaking when you stand so close together. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hi, John. Sam is expecting you. Will you be joining the meeting? Sir, sorry, will you be joining the meeting? Yes. All right, I've let Zach know you will be joining his meeting with John. I'm sorry. I think Zach is running a little bit late. I'm pretty sure he's on his way. Just to be safe, I'll send him a note to let him know that you're here. Feel free to have a seat while we wait for him. Yes, I'll see you later then. Bye bye. <laughs> So um, it, it, it's interesting, I mean, what I love about this little sequence is it's like the first time in my life that I get to look down the heart of a system and see genuine, from the point of view of a system protecting uncertainties out to me, genuine uncertainties at various levels, seeing, hearing, understanding, and that's the way the AI system actually looks. Well, it looks like, it looks like this too. But, you know, here we are. But that's not as natural for human beings to look at. All right. Now let's look at this, this, this last area here, pursuing insights and possibilities of the study. I should say, by the way, in all these areas I'm mentioning, our websites at MSR are um, going to go deep dives on, 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 the technique, on the technical background. And we probably, oh, I decided to go broad today for this audience. but. It would be great to have a chance that people that are interested to talk with you more or have you read and send questions or even get involved in research on the technical details. So let's talk about pursuing types and possibilities with AI people in society. Well, first of all, um, I should say that um, there's so much we can do to leverage AI for societal challenges of various kinds. At the same time, we're concerned about, as AI becomes more relied upon in society, Issues about trustworthiness and safety, fairness, accuracy, and transparency, influence on the economy and the distribution of, of, of jobs in our society, for example. So I'm leveraging AI and self I just love the possibilities here. And I just got back from our Microsoft Research Bangalore, where so much is going on in this space. Um, I even borrowed this picture from one of their projects, uh, working with children. Um, Here's a project I'll just mention to see this as, as aspirational with um, intern Kira Radinsky, who's now back in Israel. Um, had this idea that there's opportunities in public health that might go really have a big impact if, we, if they worked out, they panned out. One is cholera. For many years, I've known this fact that with cholera, which is an epidemic, 
a diarrheal infection. Um, if you get people fresh water promptly, they have a very a fairly low mortality rate. Over you know, over 99% survives. But without fresh water, you have like almost a 50% mortality rate. So oh wow, if we knew where to put the water and get the water on time, we can do well. In fact, the recent update on this is that now there's a short-acting vaccine for cholera, and again short acting. If you know where the call is going to be, you can get the vaccine there in advance of the epidemic and minimize the impact. So what, what Kira and I did was we looked at um, uh, over 75 years of news stories which gave information about epidemics around the world of cholera and looked at whether um, from Wikipedia, lots of details of geography, socioeconomic uh, situation, and built a predictive model that would when, it was, when it's running, it would actually literally light up the world at hot spots as to where the next epidemic would be, could be, where the, are the hot spots. And so how we could actually predict, plan, optimize, and design for the distribution of resources like water and, and trapping vaccines. This is an example of a, direct, of a direction here. We got this thing running, I remember, and it was um, up and running, and, uh, and we showed how we got its accuracy. We got, a, we got a little alert that there was a problem in Cuba, and we said, we never heard about it cholera in Cuba, we hadn't, it wasn't in our data set. And indeed, within, within a month or two, there was, was actually a, a, a new story about the cholera in Cuba. So we had some interesting anecdotal successes as well on this. Microsoft has recently invested in uh, providing more opportunities for its collaborators and colleagues in areas of agriculture, climate change, biodiversity, and water by providing hazard cycles to, based on proposals uh, to the AI for Earth program now. We hope to see more coming in. We get a kind of a big uh, um, reaction to this program coming out of our CELA group, our, our, our law group and policy group. Uh, Lucas Stropa uh, from my team um, took this on. And it's really interesting. This is a career story. He's a, uh, an environmentalist, sustainability person who was actually at Microsoft Research. And in a career discussion, I said, what do you want to do with your life? And he said, I want to be the chief environmental scientist at Microsoft. I said, let's figure out how to do that. <laughs> and, and, and then not too long after, we said, we worked out working with the team to create this, this role. Not just the role, but getting his passion behind the whole program where he could help now uh, uh, get people set up in, in, in a number of different projects. Here's an example of this realm of, of um, AI for her that, that people will enjoy. The project was Ashish Kapoor myself, and myself and a few other collaborators. And the idea was we realized that over the Earth at this moment, there are thousands of potential sources of information about the winds, the weather, airplanes. This is a snapshot of what it looks like right now if you look up in the sky, sort of more or less like this in terms of the planes overhead. Now, it turns out that um, NOAA, the National Weather Service, launches tens of balloons um, across the country at just a few sites to build that weather map that planes depend upon, that weather forecasters use. It's combined with a physics map, a physics map, a physics model, but it's very, very low grain, uh, and it's um, based on hourly balloon launches. We have to start thinking about, well, you know, even though we have limited information of ground track radar uh, and don't know exactly some of the missing details, we can actually do a little physics, right? We can say, where the CSL and interdisciplinary stuff comes in really handy, right? <laughs> so we have, we have the observed tracking ground speed of all these planes. Um, we're, we're, we, have, um, we have a bit mis missing variable of wind velocity, and, and, and we have partial information on heading and airspeed. But if you had a thousand triangles, you can start solving for the unknowns, wind speed. The basic intuition here is that if two planes are in the same region of space and you assume uh, regularity in the space and they're going in different directions, you can basically assume they're hitting the same wind field. And that's the, that's the basic intuition behind this. And there's actually a plate model we use, for those of you who know how to the models, um, to solve for winds across the, the uh, United States using a Gaussian process model. But now there's an actual cloud service running on Azure. Uh, you can go up to windflow.azureplace.net, and you can see there, no one laughed at my cloud joke. <laughs> you, you, you can see um, the, uh, uh, the NOAA site, the wind flow information, which is quite different typically, uh, and, um, and, and the differences between the two. 
But let me show you uh, some how we can ground truth, have, how, how we have fun doing ground truth in eastern Washington on a drive that actually involved my son and high school friend helped with balloons because we didn't have to do balloon technology. But so the idea basically was he said, let's actually do some. We had, we had, in the paper we wrote for um, IPSN years ago, we did whole bout sets and the standard kinds of approaches to um, trying to understand accuracy and, and show how that would work. But we also decided to launch some balloons, called the FAA up, built a weather balloon with a, with a satellite feed. Um, I have to show you because I love seeing the curvature of the Earth here, which helps us on this lens. Um, but then we said, okay, so let's um, predict where from our, all of our models, uh, where the balloon's going to land. And you see, we use the NOAA data in purple here, um, with 56.1 miles off landing. And basically, if we use um, uh, just um, a, 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 we call it the ALOC data, which is a, another data source, uh, how far we are, but we use the planes and ALOC together with, with our model to combine these, and you see how close we got, just 11.6 miles away from the landing point. So very exciting. Um, we actually now are having a lot of fun uh, over the last um, 18 months or so working with a major carrier. You, know, you can basically get the real wings and, and, and into the planners used on jet planes by creating an interface that can just call that seems like the NOAA interface, but it's wind flow interface. They can do better planning as to where to kind of route their planes to the winds and lower fuel footprint and fuel costs and so on. So another area in the societal a good uh, realm is special needs. Um, this is Saqib, who's an engineer, a Microsoft um, um, software developer in our London office. And he basically had an interesting uh, wish. He basically said, um, when I'm at a meeting, like a software dev meeting with PM and other developers, um, I talk and I just don't know if people are listening to me. And so he really wanted the system that would actually just tell him Who's in front of me? <laughs> Are they attending to me? You know, what's their emotion? We had all these kind of wedges of inference available in our cognitive services. Um, and so we ended up uh, building a system. CAI is, is a Microsoft research, research project for people with visual impairments. We built CAI, which is something you download on your iPhone now. But watch this, look at this quick video here for the, for the constellation of camera, select the channel here in your description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away, describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28 year old female wearing glasses looking at you. text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope, candlebars, paper, or room entrance, conference 2005, or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its format. Top of the left edge is not visible. Full steady. This agreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency of 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Candles to mail soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heated microwave phone And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into the seeing AI. Finally, explore our experimental features. Like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. <coughs> Experience the world around you with the CAI app from Microsoft. So I really love the um, when we shipped this out to the world and announced it in um, in London uh, last July, and just seeing sight impaired people, what sight impaired people were saying uh, on Twitter feeds and so on was just uh, heartwarming. Just a, just just the direction right now where we can go. Um, now let's talk a little bit about some of the, the, um, the rough edges of AI. I think these are important. You know, I always say that technology is neutral, it's how people use it, and of course as you have more powerful technologies, you can imagine um, great uses and also uses that would put powerful tools in the hands of people that might not have the best interests of others in mind. Um, as well as issues with uncertainty, reliability, and so on. Um, so one issue is the idea of how do we grapple with open world complexity. When I was the AAA president, then we made the theme of my presidency open world artificial intelligence, going from the lab into the world where it's much bigger, more complicated than my comment before about the simulation versus the reality of the world. How do you get reliability 
Um, and one notion is that there are known unknowns, right? So we have methods that we'll, we, we should be using in all of our approaches that give us a well-calibrated signal about how confident is the AI system at any moment. So here's the Tesla dashboard that I deal with daily. Notice it, oh, it says here, you know, always pay attention to the road. It's a good idea. Even when you present it your automatic driving system. Um, and the system actually has, it's not, it's okay. As a driver, I can tell you it's okay, not great. Has an interesting model that says auto steer is no longer steering confidently, take over steering immediately. And it makes this loud noise and says, let's go, take over. It's just good to know that this is not being very confident. Now, probably, the problem is that sometimes um, the system doesn't know what it doesn't know. So I like to always bring up this interesting loud C. Um, wisdom of the ages. I think this is really important for AI systems and for all of us. Um, we said the translation here, if he, if he did exist, but if he didn't, this is what, this, what the mythology is. Knowing that you do not know is the best. And I like this interesting translation. Not knowing that you do not know is an illness. Interesting. Um, and we're working really hard to do deep learning. We're trying to learn, so let's say, for our captioning system, which is now available in PowerPoint. Right? Put a picture in PowerPoint, turn it on, it'll, it'll start captioning for you. But we want to basically understand, we want to learn models that will give us a really good score. And that's a deep learning problem in itself, it turns out. We're doing that well. But think about the task of designing an automatic car, right? That's going to drive on the road. So you just think about all the the possibilities you have to think about in advance, right? This one got me one night, late coming back from a hockey game one night, I was playing with a, with a friend. And we're just talking in the car, it was an autopilot on an open highway, the car just great. And at a distance I saw these orange barrels and I said, you know, I have no idea what my test was going to do in autopilot. <laughs> you know, and I, just, I held on for a little bit and I said, no, I, can't. I just grabbed, I took over, so I was going to hit him head on, I think. So um, here's another one, I was heading up for a second retreat. And I, I just said, you know what, we're going five miles an hour, but I'm not sure I want to keep on going right now, because I don't know what the car's going to do. I had no idea that the car was trained on the rear ends of these gears <laughs> at the Tesla factory, right? So there's a really interesting challenge of unknown unknown to AI in general. Um, it's not intractable. We, we have technical methods. We had a paper last year at AAAI on methods that would triage people to work with machines in a way using um, a, a, a multi-armed bandit approach, so a formal method to, to figure out how to probe the space to get at blind spots in the system. A lot more to go on to do in that, in that realm. Now another area right now that's a rough edge, an important one, um, I know uh, um, we have people here at um, Carey, uh, for example, we're going off to a conference tomorrow called Fat Star. Fairness, fair, accountable, and transparent AI, machine learning, and, and plus plus with the star now. These people called the Fat ML conference. They did it that star now because it's like everything, I guess, mm -hmm. all algorithms. But um, this was, was pulled out of an article that came out a couple of years ago, like looking at some problems that a criminal justice predicted model system, modeling system had with. With, with seemingly had the bias against certain demographics and skin colors in our country. Um, and these systems called this, this, this the case, the Compass system, was being used in many courtrooms across the country to advise judges on issues like, would this person commit a crime if they were let go early without, you know, um, rather than being held in advance of their court date, would they come back to prison, would they repeat crimes? Um, and you know, it's like the, the, this article, the study of them looked at some different examples and said, well, you know, this, this person would be let go, and this person would be held, like, based on the data set. Well, to understand the data deeply, to understand the metrics for fairness, understand whether or not the data set itself, which is generated by our society, which is anything but fair in many places, uh, is going to be fair, is a really important challenge to our world, to our society. If you think about the prospect that these systems are easy to replicate and become fashionable and come into broad use, small, even small unfairness and bias could create hidden 
you know, subtle and even powerful um, recommendations and actions that would, 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 would exclude people from services, for example, from loans or homes, or put people in prison and let others go free. So it's an area we're looking at very carefully. Um, uh, at Microsoft, this isn't a quick example, and I took some slides up, but I, I didn't want to go too long today, but I'll say it verbally. Um, Anna Howard, a uh, researcher at Georgia Tech, was visiting us and decided to look at maybe a less uh, sensitive issue, look at our motion classifier, that we fielded on the web as a cognitive service at Microsoft. We found that it was biased in its accuracy, and that it was failing on children, on young children. There was in, in, in this misclassification of emotions. Children had a certain type of failure. And we actually had trouble finding the data, who did this data set, where did the data come from, oh, it was scraped from the web in this way. We actually showed how you can actually take a hierarchical approach and build a, a contact lens, like Hubble Telescope, that would correct the vision of the system for young people, for example. But we realized as a company, and now we're realizing more broadly, that we need to really get our acts together in terms of what how do we, what's our policy on documenting our data pipelines and our data sets, where they come from, so we can track them? What kind of maintenance do we need when we ship the system into the world? How do we detect various kinds of biases? What are the protected variable states? Gender, age, skin color, what's the approach? And how do we have in our compliance when we ship a, ship a system some a bare minimum requirements at Microsoft. And so a year ago, a year and a half ago, we created what's called the Ether Advisory Panel, which is loose for AI and ethics and engineering and research, and has representatives from every major division from Microsoft, and reports to Satya Nadella, our CEO, and to our senior leadership team. And the combination is sponsored by Brad Smith, our legal uh, lead, and Harry Shum, uh, our AI and our research lead, which is our MVPs. And I can tell you that the discussions are intense and interesting. On the, we're, and we're, we're, we now expand into five separate working groups. Harold today, my host, or my contact at Microsoft, who brought me here to help me come to this event, was wondering what I was doing with my phone all morning. I said, we have a very intensive ether committee decision we're making right now, and I want to be part of it uh, on a very sensitive issue on the first working group, uh, the, 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 the number one, which is, Sensitive uses of AI. Should visual recognition, for example, be used in certain situations? What's Microsoft's policy on this? Where do we stand ethically as a company? Um, we have recently we actually uh, uh, helped to write a book across our legal and research teams called The Future Computed. It's downloadable for free to see some of our thinking about where things are going in this area of AI people and society. I recommend that to you to take a look at the perspective. And then I have to say that Microsoft, uh, I in particular and others, um, worked very hard to create what's called the Partnership on AI, which brings together Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, DeepMind, um, and civil liberties organizations uh, in a kind of a shared nonprofit to do what I'm doing with Microsoft across the industry right now in terms of understanding what's the best practice in AI in the world. Um, I, I recommend people take a look if you're interested in what we're doing. Partnership on AI, partnership on AI one word, dot org. You'll see the eight tenets that all the companies agree to, as well as the, what are called the six thematic pillars of where the research is going right now. But my view is that anything we do with Ether, we're going to share with the partnership on AI. Um, and I hope other companies and groups will as well. That said, let me just end by saying that I view the, the next steps to be we need to pursue principles of intelligence. We need to figure out how we can harness AI to augment human intellect and to empower people to achieve more. We have to really always be thinking about working to solve deep and important societal challenges and to address rising rising rough edges and ethical questions as we go. And we need to collaborate widely on technology and policy and to engage multiple stakeholders, even our arch competitors. So I'll stop there. Maybe we have time for a few questions.
So I know that you're talking about um, like assisting doctors with making medical decisions. Uh, so one big problem when it comes to machine learning, for example, deep neural networks, is that it's very hard to rationalize the decisions that they're making. Is Microsoft doing any research in this area? Yes. Are you a plant in my team? <laughs> yes. So, so, so in general, um, there's a variety of opinions on how bad it is to not understand the deep rationale coming out of the AI system that comes up with recommendations, and not be able to inspect and understand it. My comment is that in the old days, in the 80s, expert systems era, based on logic, it was an easier task of sort of explaining a logical team in that Why did I conclude this? Well, A equals to B, B goes to C, C means D, and you got kind of almost an automatic natural explanation. Um, there's lots of different challenges of explanation, and I, 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 you got to point out that I didn't have that on my bullets when I said fairness and bias, but I often think about fate, fairness, accountability, transparency, explanation. Um, and to say that we have some work going on in this space. So one piece of work by Rich Caruana and the team you can look up uh, is on this idea of can we get, can we use other representations besides neural nets when it comes to non-perceptual data, non something like this, but like medical chart data to, to, to create um, an inspectable model. And we found, he found that for several medical problems, you can squeeze almost all the accuracy you get with other methods that were opaque, like neural nets and deep, and uh, forest, uh, forest of trees, decision trees, um, with this method that was inspectable. Other people say it's not so important to, to inspect, it's, it's, um, it's maybe better to show sensitivity, so you kind of just look at tools that let you visualize what happens when I change inputs to see what, how the outputs change. Um, it's interesting to, 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 to think about whether we trust but how often do you ask a doctor, why did you think that when you looked at me? Well, I learned in medical school about these symptoms. So we, we, we have to get, we have, we, sometimes we use the black boxes all around us. Um, we want to make sure that we don't get paralyzed by the fact that um, the AI systems might, might be as uninspectable as human beings at times. That's a good question. Others? Yeah. Um, what's the, are there prospects for Microsoft releasing? Oh. Are there prospects for Microsoft releasing some of its pre-trained models to build on for things like, you know, like fine-tuning from a pre-built model? I say build on. Well, first of all, so the, the, these what we call cognitive services are all available on the web through API calls, so the motion and age and gender and uh, dialogue systems. Um, um, Experts would mean different things by saying, you know, what it is that you want when you take the build on. So it's like you know, they could take the whole data set, which sometimes is hard to do with, with um, user data, who haven't given us permission to do that. Um, but over the years, we've done our best to share code, um, data when we can, when we have. Microsoft believes uh, that, uh, especially Microsoft Research, that sharing results and tools. Especially in the realm of Satya Nadella, which is now open source as the nickname of the game and shareware, uh, is better for science. It's better for us to get build a community of folks who are working with our stuff or our results to extend them. So um, we can talk more offline about the different ways you can share a machine learning model or a partial model. Um, uh, I can imagine different answers to your question. Thanks. Hello, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, so I have a question about like the thing about the uh, readmission statistics for uh, machine learning. Uh, is that is that licensed as part of uh, an outside product like with Microsoft's name on it or is there a very specific Microsoft product that is available for general release and how is that? that? System. So that system, really, that system was originally built, I read about that online, which is the secondary side of it. It was really built as part of our Amalga offering several years ago. Uh, it was called Microsoft Amalga, and that was an add-on called RAM, Readmissions Manager. Uh, and what was really exciting about it for us was, I think it was one of the first times that we actually had a system. We realized we actually built this model from a lot of data. We found it didn't work well when we transferred it to other hospitals. We realized, oh, we should build an auto ML system that you bring this thing to a hospital and you pull the string like a lawnmower. And it starts up and it goes back several months automatically on the local data. 
builds a model, and tests and trains and generates performance curves, uh, and then does <coughs> numbers and every few months and retests. And that's, that, that, that's what was exciting about that system um, when we shipped it. I have to say that um, one comment back to Ether panel, that, that you were, I know this is not exactly what you asked, but it's a really interesting comment, was back then, I think it was 2006, when we shipped that system in 2007, uh, for shipped it across the world. Uh, like a few weeks before we shipped it, I said, you know something, hey, wait a second, um, as a researcher, can you add a piece of code that says whenever you um, retrain the system at a hospital, send email to corvettsandmicrosoft.com and send me the performance curve, the area, you know, the, 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 R, the RC curve. And there I was, it was a last minute thought, right? And there I was um, getting email about cookies down the hall and you know, meetings coming up. And in the middle of it, I'd say, you know, Southampton Hospital System performing at AUC 0.72. And so now we realize that maintenance and awareness in this modern era is critical. When you ship a system, you have to really have the idea of lifelong usage in place and monitoring. Yeah? I guess the crux of that was, is it a standalone piece of software, or is it integrated into existing major Oh, it, it, was, it, was okay. it was integrated. It was, it, it was, from the point of view of Microsoft salespeople, um, it was a little bit of frosting on a big electronic health record system. When we spoke to the customers personally, they said, oh my god, get everything else, I want that thing. So <laughs> it's interesting how the different lenses on what people actually want. Okay. Have, have to talk, talk to you offline about the system. Hey. Yeah. Hi. Do you feel that AI will increase or decrease the economic divide? What I mean by that is, I, I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> well, the, the base assumption with a lot of this work is that people have access to a device yeah. that is capable of doing this. So there's evidence, I, I came off of the National Academy of Science study, uh, which published its results a year ago. Um, it was all about um, IT automation and the US workforce. AI was mentioned in it, in that section, but, but there was evidence from that work and evidence from that study that automation, more advanced automation, is one of the factors, one of the significant factor behind the growing um, inequity in resources across uh, this country. Um, and will AI further that separation between, like it was measured by um, the, the average, the, the, the the mean uh, per capita uh, GDP uh, and the median um, wages separate. So there's more wealth in our society, but there's more disparity. And you see these curves, they're striking. Um, I refer people to the National Academy study, which is available for free on the web. So what do we do about this? And how do we drive forward automation? Well, I mean, we can say things and push on directions and then observe carefully. So things that we say at Microsoft and what we're trying to do include we want to democratize these tools, we want to make them available, uh, we want to educate people to use them, we want to make sure that we can have some um, sense for where technology is going broadly in our society. Um, we're very actively involved in committees and um, new work. There's the AI index that came out, you may have seen that in January, looking at competencies over time. There's some, a recent science article that was fabulous that I like to refer people to you know, about a month and a half ago by Tom Mitchell and Eric B. Olson that looked at, let's look at machine learning. So look at machine learning, where it's going, and look at tasks and jobs where the actual machine learning would have an influence. I'm trying to get a lens on how it might, the near-term technologies might influence the distribution of work. Um, you know, let me give you my aspirational view on this. Um, many, many jobs will be, in, will be resistant and impervious. You know, creativity, artistry, craftsmanship, places where people have to use their fine motor skills to get things done. Um, uh, but jobs which might be transformed in other areas. So, you know, a truck driver, for example, might turn out that they can sleep on long haul trips across the country and have to be much better at, at doing um, uh, service-mindedness, managing uh, uh, relate, you know, man relationships with customers. 
um, doctoring might shift a little bit into more patient-oriented skills as opposed to looking at films. Um, my aspiration is this, that with increasing, and this is maybe optimistic, I know I'm an optimist, but um, with the, and maybe we'll end this city late, but with the, with the rise of automation all around us, I'd like to think that we will start to value human contact and human skills more and more, and reimburse people more and more for those skills um, in a world where there are even personas and automated systems, the, the need for humans, for other humans, will never go away. For nurturing children, for elder care, for doing, working with people, uh, uh, teaching situations and mentoring and apprenticeship. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if we achieve this new world where we see the growth of a caring economy really focused on people and people skills and people to people relationships? So it might sound optimistic, but let's get there. Thanks very much, everybody.